Hello and welcome to another extra special episode of the Sales Ops Demystified podcast. Today, we're joined by Reese Williams, who is the VP of Revenue Operations at Conversant. Reese, welcome to the show. Thank you, Tom. I'm uh, looking forward to our conversation today and uh, looking forward to uh, being part of the show. And of course, we have Alex Freeman of EBSTA on the show as well. Alex, welcome. Thank you, Tom. Reese, the, there's something very interesting on your in your career history. Something that out of the 160 or so guests we've had on the show, this is going to be a first. And it's the transition or it's the, the start off of the career, and correct me if I'm wrong, in sales ops, a move out of sales ops into sales and then back into sales ops. It, first of all, am I accurate with that um, analysis? Uh, yes, you are accurate. However, the one caveat I would, uh, I would add to that is I moved back into revenue operations I'm happy to talk about this, but there's a very important distinction between sales operations and revenue operations. Happy to go into that. And we are definitely going to touch on that later in the interview. But first, I'd like to understand why you got into sales ops in the first place and then why you decided to move out. Uh, Yes. So I I look at roughly the start of my career is uh, post-grad school. So I graduated in 2010. Uh, which if everybody remembers that point in time was a terrible time to try and get a job. So uh, I was just lucky to get a job. So it wasn't like I had my pick of jobs coming out of school. Um, however, so, you know, truthfully told, I kind of fell into sales operations. Um, but it's one of the areas that uh, over time I've come to love. And one of the things I love about it is um, operations in general. Um, you're a generalist, not a specialist. So you're dangerous in a lot of conversations. However, you're not necessarily... You know, an expert in any one conversation, uh, which has got its pros and cons, right? Particularly as you start to move up the career ladder. Um, however, I I truly enjoy it because you can go from in a single day having conversations about you know how do we do lead scoring to uh, hey we're having you know stuff fall out of the funnel for our inside sales team you know Mofu what do we need to do about it to hey what do we need to do uh, full funnel marketing uh, to support our to us, you know, SAL uh, conversation to, you know, how do we improve the sales to CS handoff? So those types of conversations, being able to have all across the customer journey, that's what I truly enjoy. And again, as we'll talk about the difference between revenue operations versus sales operations, I think that's just a further extension of that, you know, generalist role. Let's jump into that question right now then. Um, What do you see as that core distinction between the two RevOps and SalesOps? Uh, Great question. So a couple of comments here. I think a lot of companies um, call a role sales operations, but have it a sales administration. And what I mean by that is if you look at what the actual role is doing itself, they're running up, uh, occasionally running a few support uh, reports, um, doing some backend work in Salesforce. That's, Sales administration. Sales operations is where you're starting to take that and be proactive about that. What I mean by that is, is the proactive nature is when you sit there and start to say, all right, um, based upon this team, we know our inside sales team is starting to struggle um, when they get these type of leads. How can we start to think about why they're struggling? What can we do to materially affect that so to help them out? Starting to get proactive in that nature. Now, what revenue operations is, is um, we define revenue operations here at Conversant in a very particular way. So it's six work streams across the customer journey. And so this is the key difference between sales ops and rev ops is it's across the entire customer journey. And I personally take a very broad view of it. So it's everything from what is the product doing? Because you think about it, like uh, if the product releases something um, that's going to materially affect uh, our outside sales team, um, how does that then change your future quarter forecasting, the pipeline coverage you need for that team because you can forecast close win rates will go up, things like that. So again, it's across the entire customer journey. So RevOps here, and I'll quickly go through it, entire customer journey, sales ops, I think is a much more narrow point of view of that. But the six work streams and the order is important. It's process. Um, this is how you do things. So it's everything from having a first call to putting things in Salesforce. Second thing is tooling. Um, and the process dictates your tooling. Um, and again, it's not just Salesforce and that's not just your CRM. It's everything that touches your tech stack that affects revenue. 
with this with this source of record. Our source of record is sales uh, is Salesforce. The third work stream is data. So the tooling um, uh, outputs the data, and there's a very couple important things inside of data. Um, one, only measure what you can make a decision from. Uh, too many companies look at anything and everything, and you get an analysis paralysis. If you can't make a decision in it, don't look at it. Second thing is you want to fly at the right level, right? What I mean by that is, is if you're having a conversation with the board, the data should be at 60,000 feet. If you're having a conversation with your frontline sales leaders, it should be at 20,000 feet. And if you know the three of us are having a conversation and we're nerding out on data, it's probably at 2,000 feet. The fourth work stream is enablement. So the data highlights your hotspots inside of your inside of that customer journey map, and then you point your enablement at it, right? And again, with enablement, the key is, is pick one or two or three things that's going to materially affect the customer journey the most. The fifth stream is planning. So this is everything from about monthly, quarterly to annual planning, capacity planning, where and how do you add investments, not only just headcount, but marketing investments, et cetera. And then the sixth thing is execution. How are you executing against uh, all those, uh, your strategy? I feel like we're getting a masterclass here, Alex. Oh, very much so. Um, I, I just wanted to, I was really, really helpful stuff and, and loads to dig into, but I just wondered if you had any particular examples that you could share where um, focusing on, on revenue options, essentially the whole customer journey has helped deal with a blind spot, whereas if you were just focused on, say, sales ops, you might have missed something. Great question. So uh, early last year, um, one of the things that uh, we identified is that we had a classic um, MQL to SAL um, conversion problem. Um, and because we're looking at the entire customer journey map, that's you know, what traditionally is marketing into you know, BDR into sales. Um, and if you're just looking at sales ops, you might have it, you know, you might look at it, but you may not take it up that far. When we look at the funnel, we look at the entire funnel, it's the demand. One of the other key things we've done inside of the funnel that actually makes this conversation easier, and this is a total tangent, but changing your leads to account leads, not contact leads, because then you can run conversion rates all the way down through the funnel. It's super helpful. Um, so side tip for everybody out there listening. But um, one of the things that we did is, is we identified this is part of our planning process. We picked two or three things that's going to materially affect the customer journey map the most. And inside of those two or three things, there may be 15 initiatives that we have to do across those six, uh, six work streams that I mentioned. So we identified this um, MQL to SAL issue. And so then we went about uh, knocking off a bunch of the things that we had to do. So it include lead and account scoring. Uh, it include plumbing that lead and account scoring inside of Salesforce and then routing leads correctly. It included a BDR base camp and BDR first call certification because our SALs are really a, f- a first call. Um, so it had all these different elements inside of that. And what we ultimately saw is coming into the project, we had a 45% uh, essentially MQL to SAL conversion rate coming out of the project. So which was about six to nine months later, we had a 55% um, and so that's um, that's very important. Um, and this is also why, as you're thinking about data, it's very important not to look at outputs. You need to look at the inputs. And what I mean by that is output is, is essentially the score of the game, right? So you can be at halftime and we use a football, but you know, rugby or whatever, halftime, the score's 10 to 7. It's like, wow, this, the game's pretty close. It's like, well, if you actually look at the game itself, like, is it like, what's going on in each individual play? And that's why, like, if you think about it, so if we came into that scenario at 45% MQL to SAL conversion rate, I was like, ah, that's not too off. You know, uh, what you look for, depending on your distribution of inbound versus outbound is somewhere in the neighborhood of 50, 60%. It's not too off. But when you actually then break it down on team by team and start to look at it, and you're like, oh, and we're really having an issue on our outside sales team. What do we need to do on our outside sales team to start to figure that out? Oh, we can help impact that by helping the BDRs have a better first call specifically. Those are the inputs that are going to materially affect the output, which is the score of the game. Brilliant. Thanks. The other thing you said, which I thought was quite interesting, we haven't heard before, is the fact that a chunk of the work that happens in 
sales office. It's actually sales administration. Why do you think that is? And why do you think the separate role hasn't been formed? Or do you just think that people don't have the same definition of sales ops as you do? Uh, it's, and by the way, I want to be fair out there. Of like, you know, I, I think operations, whether it's sales ops, rev ops, CS ops, or just general ops is, is very ambiguous. And so I think it, it, what ends up happening is on a company by company, it's a definition. And this is where I think particularly not only the leader of whatever organization, whether it's sales ops or rev ops, um, they need to take uh, ownership of it and say, hey, what is the definition here? How do we make this proactive? But then you also want to get the organization bought into this, getting rev ops or sales ops a seat at the table because the organization realizes how valuable it is. Um, so I think there's just been a classic, you know, for the last 20 years, what is sales ops? You know, in smaller organizations, is somebody who has a Salesforce admin. And they sit there and run a bunch of reports and run some comp. It's like, well, that's not really ops. That's administration, right? Like, how do we get this into a proactive nature? Well, we're sitting down having you know, thoughtful conversations, right? So, you know, we were just running through, like a lot of companies, our annual planning exercise. And, you know, we're going through the, hey, how do you marry the top down? What do we want to grow at? What does the board want to see us to grow with the bottom up, what can we support based upon the current sales capacity, BDR capacity, marketing investment that we have today? And what's that downstream impact going to be on CS if we close those bookings? So like that is a more strategic conversation. And that's having a seat at the table and that's getting into that proactive nature. I also think the other thing is RevOps is still a relatively new term. I think you're seeing a lot of it in the last two, three, four years. So people are, you know, trying to figure out how to define it still. Makes sense. I want to ask about a time that you, within the RevOps function, have have made a significant boost in productivity of uh, whether it be sales, reps, CS, or even the marketing team, based on an initiative that the RevOps ops function have have, gen- have uh, completed. Did you have an example where you can share? Uh, yes, uh, we have a, <laughs> I have a, <laughs> we have a kind of like a big macro example, and then I can provide a more nuanced example as well. So, uh, we ended up, uh, rebuilding, uh, the entire RevOps and a lot of the, our go-to-market engine about a year and a half ago. Uh, and at that time, um, we didn't have what we classify as our go-to-market strategy down on paper. And when I talk about our go-to-market strategy, it's everything from a, uh, what's your value-based messaging framework? So how do you talk to the customer? Um, how do you evaluate opportunities internally? Um, we use MedPick, and then we use something called stage advancement criteria, which says, hey, if something's in an S2, it's got to have these different things. And if, if you're in our MIA team versus our inside team, it doesn't really matter. An S2 is an S2 and it's an S2. All right, so stage advancement criteria, what's your ICP? Who are you going out to? How do you score that um, from a lead standpoint? Um, what is the operating cadence? And this is one of the big things that you know we spend a lot of time on is operating cadence is uh, when do you have meetings? Who's in that meeting? What is the objective in the agenda of that meeting? So you can be very intentional and thoughtful because if you think about it, operating cadence is truly the execution of your market strategy. And how is all that aligned against the customer journey map? So we didn't have any of that. And we went about over the, you know, uh, a lot of individuals putting a lot of work over nine, 12 months, uh, you know, installing, we use command the message. So installing command the message, we rolled out stage advancement. We've done a couple versions of our ICP. We have an ABM strategy on the marketing side. Uh, You know, we constantly do tweaks to our operating games. So like, being able, and we now land that strategy on a single PowerPoint slide, which we affectionately internally call the Mona Lisa, um, uh, because there's all sorts of colors and all sorts of things everywhere. But that then, anytime, you know, if you say the Mona Lisa to anybody on our team, they know what it is. And when you talk about these things like stage advancement or command message or opera, everybody knows what it is. I think what's very important is, is if your strategy is not down on a piece of paper, um, you don't have a strategy because people need to be able to see it, visualize it, and be able to point to it. And then you have a playbook in which you can just layer people on, right? 
what you're trying to do is build that foundational structure so that you can bring in somebody new or promote from within and people just know the place. It's like, oh, hey, I'm going to run a command message with this individual, this, this type of inbound lead, and this is how I'm going to run it. So I, I think that's a big macro example that's not a, you know, a great nuanced example. Um, one of the things, one of the projects we're working on right now is um, the RevOps. I mentioned that we do planning um, and we try and identify two or three things across the customer journey that's going to have the biggest impact. And one of those items right now is this sales, the CS handoff and CS back into sales. Um, and there's a whole host of things inside of that. So there's everything from uh, customer segmentation to cap DB scoring to we have to do a whole host of plumbing inside of Salesforce to make sure the fields that we have from command the message, which again is our value-based messaging framework, flow down into CS, right? Because if only sales is using that, again, that's sales operations, not revenue operations. It then makes it challenging for our CS partners to sit down and say, oh, hey, and during the sales process, you said this was a positive business outcome for you. Um, and if they don't know what that is, then they don't really know what the definition of success of time to value and onboarding is for the customer. So we're working on that process. Uh, we like to affectionately refer to most things internally as crawl, walk, run. And we're definitely still in the crawl phase and working towards the walk phase of that. Also, I love the idea of the Mona Lisa. Uh, it's just uh, it's, it's, it, it, it's almost like marketing, putting labels on things, but I bet everybody, as you mentioned in your team, is very aware that the Mona Lisa exists and they're aware that this is like the, the Bible or the this is the strategy here in this one slide. Um, I'd like to move on to forecasting and uh, understand a little bit about how you're forecasting in 2021, especially with 2020 potentially being uh, not normal, not, not, not a normal revenue year. Wait, it wasn't normal? <laughs> Um, yeah, so what's very important about forecasting is we take a, um, we take a much more broad point of view of forecasting. Um, and I think, again, this is, uh, I think the difference between sales ops and rev ops. Sales ops tends to think about just in quarter and out quarter forecasting. Um, and we think about it much broader. So we have five pillars that we think about forecasting. It's important to understand those pillars first before we can talk about what is traditional forecasting. So pillar number one is do you understand your go-to-market strategy? Do you have something down on paper? Because if you're sitting there saying, hey, look, if you don't have stage advancement criteria to say this is an S3 and so I'm going to have this as a commit, well, if you don't have that and you have one team saying this is an S3 and another team saying that this is an S3, you're all over the place, right? So you have to understand your go-to-market strategy inside of that. You know, what is your value-based messaging framework? How are all of your ops the same? So what is your consistent language? And that's stage advancement criteria for us. The second pillar inside of forecasting is this concept of uh, essentially operational TAM versus capacity planning. And this is similar to what I described earlier of where you look out uh, and essentially say, you know, we did some FY22. Um, all right, we're, we're one year or our fiscal year is, uh, we're a month off. And so when I refer to FY22, that's actually this calendar year. So calendar year 21 uh, planning and said, hey, we want to do this much bookings. Do we have enough accounts to go after to do that bookings inside of what has our been historical conversion rates from lead to SAL to SQL? Um, you know, what is that capture rate? You know, because if you look at it and you're saying, hey, we want to do 50 million in bookings, which represents 50% growth, but then that turns into a market share of 50%, you're probably not going to get there. So being able to marry what is the realistic slash aggressive bookings rate with what you can theoretically do from the people and investment you have today in a realistic um, capture rate, conversion rate, et cetera. So that's that operational TAM and capacity planning. The third pillar is understanding those historical conversion rates, velocity rates, et cetera, by team, um, and not just the peanut butter spread. Uh, we have three teams. Uh, so we look at uh, all on a regular basis, understanding what is our uh, velocity, you know, conversion rates um, to understand that. Because here's the problem is, again, as you're thinking about forecasting, if you're sitting here saying, you know, our outside sales team who tends to have closer to a six month sales cycle, and um, and they don't have enough pipeline uh, this quarter. 
and you're asking them to forecast above where their pipeline is and based upon the conversion rates, well, really what you're starting to look at, particularly understanding the velocity is we now look with our outside sales team, we're looking two quarters out to start to think about that because that's really the pipeline you're creating today is really affecting the forecast they're going to have in two quarters. So understanding those conversion rates and velocity helps you in that, that forecasting. So that's the third pillar. Fourth pillar is what the historical, traditional in-quarter, out-quarter forecasting is. We run a pretty tight forecasting process. We actually just got out of the meeting this morning. It's every Friday. We look at current quarter, next quarter. Um, we look at our commits upside, You know, all that type of stuff, pretty standard stuff. Uh, and then the fifth pillar is dependencies. Um, and what I mean by that is so strategic de- uh, decisions and dependencies. You know, if again, if you want your outside sales team to all of a sudden do X two quarters out, which is a 50% increase. And part of that is based upon something the product's going to deliver, but product is behind their sprint cycles. So they're not going to ultimately deliver that. And there's not the pipeline that's already sitting there. Can you start to think about uh, forecasting for the enterprise team or do you have to back that down? So again, that more holistic paints a better picture so that when you actually get into what is traditional in-quarter and out-quarter forecasting, uh, it makes it a lot easier. So that's a very long-winded way of you know, talking about what you know, our traditional forecasting is. Inside of last year, um, what we ended up doing was we do a readout to our executive team and our, our, our leadership team, and we call it a RevOps readout. We do it once a month. And we look at all these data points across the customer journey, and we try and pull out key themes that people can go and make strategic decisions about. Again, only look at data you can make a decision about. Um, And one of the things we were looking at last year was the extension of our sales cycles. So we saw it wasn't so much as uh, all this pipeline flushed out, but it was an extension of the sales cycles. Uh, And we saw it particularly in our team in EMEA. And we're continuing to look at that. And what's interesting is, is... our uh, open pipeline sales cycle um, is um, stayed relatively uh, lengthened across most of the teams, uh, but we're starting to see a downward trend in one of our teams. So with that team, we can start to say, hey, well, look, they may be starting to come out of this. So as we think about forecasting for them, we can probably start to get back to a normal forecasting cycle. Whereas our two other teams with those extended forecasts, um, they're probably still in a normal forecast or in a uh, pandemic style forecast team where we're having to look further out and making sure we're layering a pipeline on today for multiple quarters out. Makes total sense. And I love that we've got another framework out of that question as well, Reese. So final question, who in the world of RevOps would you most like to take for lunch? Oh, man. <laughs> um, that... Uh, you know, I don't have anybody in particular uh, off the top of my head. However, one of the things that, uh, particularly when I rolled into this role a year and a half ago, that I try and do on a monthly basis is I try and reach out to different sales ops, rev ops leaders at different companies, big, small, different verticals, you know, B2B, B2C, et cetera, just to like gratuitously, like, I, like, look, I'm not the smartest man in the world. So, like, I want to gratuitously take as many different great ideas and then wrap it into our process. And so I think it's less about like, oh, hey, here's the Einstein of RevOps. And it's more about like, like you could be a RevOps leader at a 10 person company, but if you got some badass process or stuff like that, like I want to go to lunch with you and I want to take what you're doing and help implement that here and try and innovate and make what we're doing that much better. It's a solid answer. Can I steal a bonus extra question? Sorry, just... um thinking back right to the beginning when you were talking again about the difference between um, operations versus, um, I can't remember the term, analyt- not analytic, um, admin, administration, there we go. I was just thinking t- advice for either people who feel that in their operations role, it's a bit more administrative or or the other way around, um, you know, senior sales leaders or, or, or business owners who are, who are again interested in boosting their function, they think actually I'm mainly just asking them administrative things. Do you have any advice to, to either of those different stakeholders? Uh, I, I'd offer two pieces of advice. Uh, one, go and have as many different conversations as you can with other sales ops and rev ops leaders and figure out how you want it to look in your organization. And then two, part of where we're at right now at RevOps is you got to evan- evangelicalize 
um, and I may have screwed that up, uh, it internally at your company, right? I mentioned this RevOps readout that we do internally once a month. Part of the goal of that RevOps readout is not only delivering the data, but part of it is evangelicalizing what we're doing because so much of sales ops, rev ops is buttons behind the scenes work that has this profound impact, but you need that seat at the table. You need the key executive leaders to be like, oh man, I can't do my job unless I'm getting this awesome data or, you know, oh man, if we tweak this process or we instill this. Um, so get that seat at the table, you know, highlight what you're doing and try and understand, like, you know, take it from that reactive to that proactive. Great. Thanks. Awesome. Well, Reese, I want to thank you for giving us so much knowledge. We got the six pillars of RevOps. We got the Mona Lisa revenue strategy slide and also five, I'm not sure if they're pillars or five like uh, considerations for forecasting. Um, it was an incredibly, um, I don't know, like amount of volume of structured information um, that I think the audience are going to find really valuable. So Reese, thank you so much for your time. Gentlemen, I've truly enjoyed it. Thank you very much and uh, I wish everybody the best of luck out there.